Welcome to lecture 10 of the series on inverse problems. And uh, the first lecture today I would like to devote to some examples, to a very practical explanation and a numerical experiment on regularization. And uh, I do that also because I want to motivate why I'm now using, now moving uh, to uh, investigate the Fourier transform. So let me quickly remind you what we did up to now. So we have the inverse problem, KU equals G. Uh, we have an approximation to G with the error bound delta. We always assume that G is uh, in the source space of K plus. And we assume that K is compact and that we have a singular system, sigma K, UK, and VK. And uh, in that case, we can uh, define the minimum norm solution U plus. We already did it. And uh, U alpha plus is a regularization defined by the regularization functions G alpha of sigma. As usual, so I don't go into detail about so uh, let's for a moment assume that G is G delta. So uh, we have uh, measured correctly, but we don't know. So uh, the error level delta that we get is still larger than zero. So we have correct data, but we think that it might be incorrect. So we have an error level data delta that's given. And uh, so we choose a regularization. And of course, we choose the regularization parameter alpha larger than zero. In that case, although the data is correct, we still make a mistake because now we compute our u alpha plus according to the formula that we have. And that's not the same as u plus. So we find that in this case, the difference between u alpha plus and u plus, and we already computed that, is given by the sum over all k, sigma k g alpha of, of sigma k minus one squared plus the known term over here. Okay, now uh, let's discuss this term once again. Well, I think we also uh, already did that. So uh, for a moment, fix sigma, then uh, we know uh, due to our uh, assumptions on g alpha, uh, we have that G alpha of sigma converges to one over sigma for alpha going to zero. And uh, for fixed alpha, of course, we have that sigma times G alpha of sigma goes to zero. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you can easily check for all our methods that uh, for, um, for, uh, for a fixed alpha and sigma relatively large, um, this over here will be very close to one, because um, uh, we'll be very close to one. So the whole term over here will be around zero. Then on the other hand, if sigma, if alpha is fixed, but sigma is very small, then this over here will be in the order of zero. So the whole term will be on the order of one. So effectively, what are we doing when we are computing u alpha plus for the correct uh, g? We are replacing the coefficients over here. We're damping them. We're for alpha, uh, for sigma k small, uh, for, for sigma k large and uh, k small. This is almost one over sigma k. So the terms over here more or less coincide. But for, uh, for sigma k small or k large, this is almost zero. And so we are effectively leaving, we're damping these coefficients. So uh, more or less, we are leaving the terms out. Um, that means that independent of what uh, kind of regularization we take, and we had quite a lot, um, it's always the same thing. It more or less, less looks like a truncated singular value decomposition, because the first terms are OK. And uh, the rest terms, we, leave, uh, we don't leave completely out, but we damp them. And uh, so these are the, the parts of the solution in these UK for K large is simply going away. Okay, um, 
So the question is, what does that actually mean? And um, we let's assume, um, further let's assume, and we've uh, shown this for one or two examples, that uh, UK is highly oscillating for large K. So the higher K is the, the higher oscillate, the more oscillating uh, the UK, the basis functions or singular functions UK are. So what we are effectively doing is, we are taking away highly oscillating parts of the function, and that means we're smoothing it. I hope that's uh, something that's uh, quite understandable. Next question is, how bad is that actually? Well, um, we've also we've already proved it in a wider sense, but um, we've shown that uh, uh, not only this uh, part over here gets small, but also the GVK squared over sigma K. Oh, that should be, no, sigma K squared is nice. Um, also, uh, the GVK goes to zero very fast. And uh, since I will use this a little bit later, um, let me look at a very short example. Um, let's assume that g is a, a function from minus pi to pi to r. And uh, let's for a second assume that the singular vectors are actually the um, Fourier modes. So uk and vk are e to the ikx. Um, and let's further assume that uh, n is, uh, g is n times differentiable. First, we can express G as a Fourier series with the known coefficient functions. Um, G of X is sum over all K, Fourier coefficients AK times A e to the IKX. Then uh, the nth derivative of N is uh, given by sum over all K, K to the N, AK, I, E to the IKX. Now, taking the nth derivative, uh, that means that... Um, the sum over all k, that's the, um, um, this, this is g of x. Now taking the nth derivative, we get this over here, right? And there's a minus times, excuse me, there's a times i to the n, of course, which I forgot. And, uh, but that means that uh, the square of the coefficient uh, is summable. So sum over all k, k to the n, a k square is less than infinity. And that means that a k decays like one over k to the n. So it's not only uh, that uh, this function over here, oops, that this function uh, gets uh, gets small, but it even gets small by a, a dedicated rate. And uh, um, in this, uh, um, if the whole thing is n times differentiable, then we find that it even goes with one over k to the n, to n. Okay, um, so that means that if we leave the, the higher order terms away, if we leave them out, then it's not that problematic because they are converging to zero very fast anyway. So um, leaving them out might not make too much of a difference and might not make too much of a problem. And uh, that's also something we're going to look at in the numerical experiment. Okay, um, then let's look at another example. And uh, I would like to change my setting a little bit. And uh, in the following, I will take the operator K as the identity operator. And you should be shouting out now, okay, you can't do that. Because of course, uh, if we're looking at something like L2 of uh, minus pi pi, uh, this is not a compact operator. Let's ignore that for a second and um, let's write something that's very close to a singular value decomposition. So we take x equal to y, so that's L2 of minus pi pi. Uh, we take uk and vk as uh, e to the i kx uh, times one over two pi, so that's now an orthonormal system on L2 of minus pi pi. And if we set sigma k equal to one, we find that u is the sum of all k, sigma k, u, and uk times vk. That looks very much like a singular value decomposition. So uh, 
Is it? Uh, well, it's not, because uh, if it was, then the sigma k should converge to zero, but they don't. They're all constant at one. And so this is not a decaying series. It doesn't decay to zero. And, um, and we always assumed that or proved that for compact operators. So this is not really a singular value decomposition, but it's something that's very, very close. OK, um, now. Using our normal formalism, uh, we can uh, look at uh, Tikhonov also for this problem. And uh, in that case, we have u alpha plus is the um, is the minimum or the argument minimum of norm k u minus g squared plus alpha squared times norm of u squared. That was our definition of Tikhonov. And we also we already proved that uh, this u alpha plus satisfies the equation. K, uh, k adjoint k plus alpha squared i uh, times u alpha plus is k adjoint times g. Excuse me, g. And of course, g is the same as u if k is the identity operator, but anyway. So, um, but now if k is the identity operator, then this is the identity operator and this one is two. So we find that u alpha plus is nothing but one over one plus alpha squared times g. So what does our uh, regularization, our Tikhonov regularization do in this case? Well, it's, it's not very useful. It just takes the data and multiplies it with one over one plus alpha squared. So, that's definitely not useful. Um, we would expect something like the data getting smoother, and we would expect uh, that higher order um, singular functions, so, so that uh, UK with a large K would somehow be damped. So that would fit into uh, our theory. Now, um, we can get that by taking a different norm. So rather than, or, or seminal, uh, rather than trying to minimize KU minus G plus alpha squared norm of U squared, we take here the norm of the nth derivative of U, um, assuming that U is in fact n times differential. Now, what we have then is um, U alpha plus is now defined as the minimum of uh, KU minus G squared plus alpha squared and the nth derivative of uh, U. Why might that make a difference? Well, we've been penalizing up here, we've been penalizing just the size, just the size of the function. And uh, the Tikhonov regularization responded by, okay, so I'll make the function smaller. And uh, so um, that um, punishment over here, that penalization will get smaller, right? But, um, here, uh, what we penalize is the derivative. Let's say, for example, first derivative. Now, um, if we penalize the uh, first derivative, then we get functions where the uh, first derivative is smaller. And so it will not oscillate that fast. So the idea behind this is quite sure, is, is uh, uh, quite typical. We are penalizing that the, of, uh, that, uh, the function just moves up and down. We are penalizing the first derivative. We're making the first derivative smaller. OK, so uh, we would expect that this gives um, at least a reasonable approach. So uh, this, can, this problem can easily be solved. I mean, we just represent g as usual by the Fourier coefficients. Uh, insert everything and just like in, you do everything like in the Tikhonov case, the true Tikhonov case, and you find that uh, the minimum of the, um, uh, of that, uh, this, uh, you represent U as the sum over all K, uh, AK times UK, and you find that uh, the minimum is uh, given at AK equals to gk, which is actually the scalar product of j and uk, time uh, over 1 plus alpha squared k to the 2n. And uh, you immediately see that uh, if you take n equals to 0, you get back normal Tikhonov, and then you have just here just the um, scalar product of g and gk times or over 1 plus alpha squared, which, which is what we already computed over here. 
Okay, uh, also for a general case, uh, you would get so with, um, with uh, not all singular values equal to one, uh, you can easily do that too. And you find that G alpha of sigma in that case, it should be chosen as sigma over sigma squared plus alpha squared k to the 2n. Okay, um, now um, choosing a sigma, uh, should sigma k, otherwise that doesn't make too much sense. Okay, um, so the conclusion of this is that uh, first choosing an appropriate norm is very important and it really makes a difference and we'll see that. The second thing is all regularizations with k alpha plus linear can somehow be represented using the singular value decomposition and they all share the same properties. They more or less behave all, all behave like tr truncated singular value decomposition. So although we thought that uh, we had now a big zoo of regularization methods, we, it now turns out that they all have the same problems and the same deficiencies. In the second part of the numerical experiment, I will turn to a nonlinear K alpha plus, and uh, that's the uh, new, uh, total variation defined by the norm of, uh, by taking as the penalizing term, uh, I should add an alpha squared over here, or an alpha to have a regularization method. So here we um, penalize the, not the second derivative, not the uh, L2 norm of uh, the first derivative, but um, the, uh, we, the one norm of the first derivative. And uh, we're going to see that makes a tremendous difference. And uh, <laughs> that also says that choosing the right regularization method may in fact be quite difficult.